All right, so we started talking about parabolas on Tuesday. So we looked at this parabola. We talked about the directrix and the focus and the vertex and the lattice rectum. And we talked about how a parabola is just the set of all points that are equidistant from the focus and the directrix. Okay? So any point here will be the same distance from the focus and the directrix. Okay? Because the directrix is P units, the focus is P units. And then we talked about the lattice rectum being a total of 4P, which means 2P here and 2P here. Okay, so that's where we left off, if I remember correctly. So that's a lot of stuff that we talked about with the parabola. Now, it's important to recognize the difference between standard form. We talked, I, I did explain a little bit because we were looking at one and I had the X squared versus Y squared. But the x squared, remember, that's the standard parabola, the one we're used to seeing. x squared equals 4py. That's going to be one who is opening up. For this, the equation for the directrix is going to be y equals negative p. We're assuming that this is going to be vertexed at the origin, okay? Not centered at the origin because it doesn't have a center, but it's going to be vertexed at the origin. The vertex is going to be sitting on the origin. The directrix is y equals negative p, and the focus is going to be at zero p, which makes sense because it's they're both p units away from the vertex, and the vertex is sitting at zero. Same deal with the y squared equals 4px. Here it's centered at zero, so the directrix is the line x equals negative p, and the focus is p zero. Okay. So if you're given an equation and you want to find the focus and the directrix, what do you need to find? It's not A, it's not B, it's not C, or D, or E, or F, or G, or H, or I, or J, or K, or L, or M, or N, or O. It's P. Okay? So, if we've got Y squared equals 8X, we want Y squared equals 4PX. So what am I going to have to set equal to each other to try to solve for P? If y squared equals 8x and y squared equals 4px, what can I set equal to each other? 4p equals what? 4p equals 8. Does that make sense? The y squared is y squared. The x is x. The only two things that are different are the 8 and the 4p. So if 4p equals 8, what is p equal to? Y'all are super chatty today. <laughs> two, yes. So if P equals two, this is Y squared, so this is gonna be opening like this. So what is my directrix? It's gonna be a vertical line. So it's what? X equals negative two, yes. Remember, it's a line, so it's got to be x equals or y equals. And then what's my focus going to be? 2, 0. It's a point. 2, 0. Now, I can get even more specific and graph this even better because I know my lattice rectum is how long? 
4p, right? It's 8, which means it's going up 4, down 4. So I know my lattice rectum is here and here, which means my parabola has to open up that wide. That's why we like that lattice rectum. It gives us those points to dictate how wide our parabola is without us having to actually plug points in and get values, okay? Any questions about that? Parabolas are pretty straightforward. I don't know where they got negative three from. See, they plotted points because they didn't use their lattice rectum. Oh, the, the, the negative three was wrong. I mean, I don't know where that came from. I mean, it was just flat out wrong. It's negative two. Here they fixed it. All right, so here we talk about the lattice rectum. And like I said, it's the line segment that joins the parabola through the focus. And it has that length of 4p. Okay? Now, I didn't mention this, but every now and then p can be negative. Right? If p is negative, that means that the parabola will be opening in the opposite direction. So normally it opens up. So if p is negative, it's opening in the other direction. So the directrix would be above and the focus would be below. Same way with the ones on the y. So we need the, we need the absolute value of 4p to be the lattice rectum. That, that way we account for the fact that if p is negative. Okay? So let's find the standard form of an equation whose focus is 8, 0, and whose directrix is negative 8. x equals negative 8. So, if we look at this, the focus is at 8, 0, and the directrix is at negative 8. So I know it's going to be a parabola on its side, so which is going to be squared, the x or the y? So it's going to be y squared equals 4px, right? That's the standard form. Well, what's p? Remember, p is just how far we are, how far the focus is. If we're given the focus is at 8, that is p. Yes, that's the standard form. And that's the sideways one anyway. Yes, sir. Would you always point A and go negative A on the other side? Is that what you when, mean? When, it, when it gave us that information. Okay. It gave us that the focus is at 8 and the directrix was at negative 8. So that gives us y squared equals 32x. So that tells us that our lattice rectum is 32. Half of 32 is 16, so I would have to go up to 16. Way up here, way down here. So that's a really fat parabola. Yes, ma'am. Definition of focus is P0. And that's the definition of what the focus is. That's how we find the focus and the directrix. What's the definition of the directrix? X equals negative P. 
What's the definition of where the focus is? P0. So if we're given those points, we just look at them and there's P. Okay? When we look here, focus, P0. Directrix, x equals negative P. The only reason that we had to divide by 4 before was because we were given the equation first and had to solve for P. Now we're given the point P and have to solve for the equation, so we had to multiply it by 4. Okay? That's the difference between these two things. The super fat parabola. And of course, parabolas translate. X minus H, Y minus K, or X minus H, Y minus K, the other way. Just means that we're going to shift where our vertex is. We can still move our focus. It's going to go in the direction of whatever our major axis is. Our lattice rectum will still go f up, down, or side to side along our focus. Okay? So, let's look at one. We want to start by finding the vertex. So what's our vertex going to be? X minus H, Y minus K. Our vertex is going to be HK. Just like it always is. We always change the signs. So what's our vertex going to be? 2, negative 1. Two, negative one. Bless you. All right. So that's our vertex. If we look at this as being in the st uh, standard form, x squared equals 4PY. It's x squared, which means it's going to be opening up, right? So we know it's going to be opening kind of up. What's the coefficient? 4p going to be set equal to? What's the coefficient here? So we're going to set 4p equal to 4 because that's what's in front of the y of that equation. So if 4p equals 4, what is p equal to? p equals 1. Therefore, our focus is 1 up and our directrix is 1 down. So the focus, let's change colors. Focus will be here, and our directrix will be that line, one below. So this is going to be the line y equals what? Negative 2, because it's one below negative 1, right? And our focus is going to be the point what? 2, 0. Right? So now I'm going to look at my lattice rectum, which has a length of what? Four. Four. So that means I'm going two in each direction from my focus, right? 
So from my focus, I go over two, over two. Bless you. So that gives me this parabola. Yes, sir. Two, negative one. Do Always do the opposite. Mm -hmm. So we always go half the distance from the vertex on each side because of the lattice rectum and then draw our parabola. Okay? Does that make sense? Can y'all follow that? The hardest part on this one is recognizing the st standard form with the X minus H, the Y minus K, and remembering, change the signs, find your vertex. Okay? All of these have that same X minus H, Y minus K. When we do ellipses, when we do hyperbolas, when we do uh, parabolas, circles, they all have that X minus H, Y minus K to dictate either where their centers are or where their vertices are or, you know, where their starting points are. Okay? For, for ellipses, for hyperbolas, for uh, circles, it's going to be their centers. For parabolas, it's going to be their vertexes. Okay? All right, here's an application problem. So an engineer is designing a flashlight using a parabola reflecting mirror, parabolic reflecting mirror, and a light source. The casting has a diameter of 6 inches and a depth of 4 inches. What's the equation of the parabola used to shape that mirror? Okay. And then, at what point should the light source be placed relative to the mirror's vertex? So let's start by looking at the equation of the parabola. So this is going to give us a parabola that has 6 inches at its top, 4 inches tall. So if we center the vertex at the origin, then it's going to go 3 across, 3 across, right? Because it's got a total of 6. 6 inches at the top. Therefore, it's going to be 3 on the right, 3 on the left. It goes up 4. so. Those points are going to be 3, 4. This point's going to be what? Negative 3, 4, right? Does that make sense? Just setting it up. Most of the time, that's the hardest part for most people. Just setting up the problem. Well, once we've got that, we know that the equation is x squared equals 4py. Well, we've got a point, 3, 4. We've got another point, negative 3, 4. We can use either one of those points to find out what P is. Because that's those are the three unknowns, right? X, Y, and P. We know X and Y, so we can solve for P. So let's plug 3 and 4 in. When X is 3, Y is 4. So 3 squared is 9. 4 times 4 is 16P. Divide by 16, P equals 9 over 16. So if P is 9 over 16, we can plug that back in. We get X squared equals 4 times 9 over 16Y. 4 
4 will go into 16 four times, we get x squared equals 9 fourths y. That's the equation for that parabola. And you can test it, because if you plug 3, 4 in, if x is 3, you get 9. If y is 4, 9 fourths times 4 is 9. Yeah, 3, 4 works. Okay? Well, that last sentence is the answer to the second question. So the second question is where do you put the light source at? Well, the light source should always be put at the vertex, I mean at the uh, focus, okay? That's the optimum place to put anything. When you're talking about parabolas, that's where you put stuff. When you're talking about parabolic telescopes, things like that, you put the vertex, or you put the uh, mirror at the uh, focus. That's just how you do it, okay? Now I'm telling you, now you know. If you didn't know that before uh, for this problem, now you do. So where do you put it at? 0p, right? So you put it 9 16 inches above the vertex or above the bottom of the flashlight. Okay? Yes, sir? In this case, there isn't one. For, for an application problem like this, there's not. What we talk about it for is because it's how we define the parabola. Because a parabola is defined as all the points that are the same distance from the focus and the directrix. So we have to have a line that gives us that equidistance from the focus. Does that make sense? So if we've got, if we've got a point here and then a line, then every point that is the same distance you know, generates this curve. And that line is called the directrix. That's all it is. It really doesn't have an application in terms of put something at the directrix. You know what I mean? It's just kind of how we define the parabola. Okay? Any questions on parab I started to say parab parabolas. Parabolas. Nope. All right, then we are going to talk about parametric equations, and we will be done. This is the last section. Are you all excited? So we skip 9-4? We do skip 9-4. Mm -hmm. So the objectives for this section, y'all did not seem near as excited about this being the last section as I thought y'all were going to be, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to use plotting point, uh, point plotting to graph plane curves described by parametric equations. We're going to eliminate the parameter in parametric equations. We're going to find parametric equations for functions, and we're going to understand the advantages of using parametric equations. Okay? So, suppose that t is a number in an interval. A plane curve is the set of ordered pairs x and y where x is some function of t and y is some function of t, okay? Generally, t is going to be a time function. So we're saying x is changing over time and y is changing over time. And we're going to represent x and y as two things that are both changing over time. The variable t is called the parameter, and the equations x equals f of t and y equals g of t are called parametric equations. So instead of having one equation for x, and or one, one set of one equation with x and y in it, I turn it into two equations, one with x as a function of t and one as a, uh, y as a function of t, okay? And this is called parameterizing functions. This may sound like super stupid, you know, why would you do that? Why are you going to make it more complicated? And that's why we had to put that understanding the advantages of it, you know, why, why do we do that? So there are times when it makes more sense to do this, okay? 
So how to do this. If you've got parametric equations, you're going to select some values for t. You're going to take those t's and plug them into x and y. That's going to give you ordered pairs for x and y. You're going to plot those x's and y's, and then you're going to connect them using a smooth curve. Now, when I say a smooth curve, what's a smooth curve? What's not a smooth curve? That's not a smooth curve, OK? That's like the teeth of some monster. So here we have a plane curve defined by a parametric equation set. Notice that a lot of times we always define our t. We put a domain restriction on t. And here was no different. We say t is always going to be from negative 2 to 2. And that's good. It lets us know we're only dealing with a specific set. So we can do basically a t-chart that's a little more t-box maybe. No. Tree chart. I don't know. Three chart. T, X, Y. So when T, we'll do negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. We'll do the whole domain here. The integers for the domain. Remember, these are real numbers, not just integers. So when T is negative 2, we just plug that negative 2 into our X equation. So we get negative 2 squared plus 1. So what's negative 2 squared? 4 plus 1 is 5. Okay. And then y is 3t, so 3 times negative 2 is what? Negative 6. So that gives us the point 5, negative 6. So then we do the same thing for negative 1. Negative 1 squared plus 1. So what's negative 1 squared? 1 plus 1. 3 times negative 1, negative 3. 0 squared plus 1, 1 squared plus 1, 2 squared plus 1, okay. 3 times 0, 3 times 1, 3 times 2, all right. So now we've got a set of pair, um, ordered pairs. We're going to take those and we're going to graph them. All right, so we've got 5, negative 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's get a different color. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 5, 6. 2, negative 3. Uh, 1, 0. 2, 3, 5. Notice I don't go past those points because that was the end of our domain for T, right? Now, one thing about this is t is defined from negative 2 to 2, which means we're going in a logical direction, okay? So a lot of times it makes sense for us to dictate what direction we're going. When we plot x squared plus 3, you know, we just get a parabola, it doesn't matter what direction we're going in because we don't really have any flow, right? We, you know, we talk about x going from negative to positive, so it's easy to see what direction we're going in with x and y, but if we've got something like this, we don't know what direction t is going in because t is not represented on our graph. So we need to go and put some arrows in dictating what direction t is going in. So our first point was at 5, negative 6. Our second point was at 2, negative 3, so we're going in this direction. Okay.
with parametric equations, we have equal to, so it's okay to include those points on the end, but we do not go past them, okay? If these had not had the equal to symbols, we would have needed to have put holes there, right? Because it wouldn't have included those points. We could have tested those points to see where we were approaching, but we couldn't have included the points because they wouldn't have been in the domain, okay? But since it did, we can put dots there. We just can't go past them. I guarantee you, I'll give you a problem like this on the test, people will, oh, this is just a parabola. You know, don't do that, okay? Make sure you stop where the domain stops, okay? All right, eliminating the parameter. So if we eliminate the parameter in a set of parametric equations, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to just one equation with just x and y in it, basically. Now, when we do this, it may be necessary to change the domain. Because like with this equation, if I were to write that in x and y, I'm going to get y squared equals something, right? Because it's a parabola, but it's not just the whole parabola. It's restricted to just from 1 to 5, right? So it's going to be important for us to watch that and make sure that if we need to change the domain, we change the domain, okay? Do you all see that? They label those points, every one of them wrong. They put the five negative six at the top, two negative three at the top. Hey, they got that one right. They got those two wrong though. They had it going in the wrong direction. Pearson's bad today. All right, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> All right, so say we have this, we wanna find and graph the rectangular equation of a curve defined parametrically. We want to start by taking this parametric set of equations, eliminate the parameter, and then graph it. Okay? So if we've got x equals 6 cosine t and y equals 4 sine t, and we're saying that t has to be between pi and 2 pi. So how am I going to eliminate a parameter here? Did they give us anything? No. Okay. thought maybe they would have given you some hints to this. They, apparently they want me to give them to you. So, when we have trigonometric functions, we're going to have to play around with them and see what we can do to make one fit into the other kind of deal. What's our one big thing that we know we can always use when it comes to trig identities? our favorite trig identity, Pythagorean identity. Cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. It's our favorite thing to use, okay? So, if we take that and rewrite it using cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals one. If x is six cosine t, cosine t equals what? X over six. I shouldn't have gave you that. I'm not going to let it do it for you. I'm going to do it so I don't give away stuff. If x equals 6 cosine t, what is cosine equal to? Divide by 6. Cosine t equals x over 6. Right? If y equals 4 sine t, what is sine t equal to? y over 4. So if we go back and plug those into our Pythagorean identity, we get x over 6 squared plus y over 4 squared equals 1. 
Well, this is just x squared over 36 plus y squared over 16 equals 1. Well, what is that? We did do it the other day. What was the question? What is that? It's an ellipse. Right. Because it's square plus square. Square minus square would be hyperbola. So, what's our major axis? Major axis is x because it's where the bigger number's at. So, if we look at it, our major axis is x, so what is a equal to? Six. a equals 6. What is b equal to? Four. b equals 4. So we go 6 units along our major axis and 4 units along our minor axis. Okay? Now, the question here is, if t is from pi to 2 pi, how does that restrict our domain? So we have to look at the values that that generates. What is cosine of pi? Negative 1. So that gives us negative 6 for our x. So we start x starts at negative 6. And it goes from negative 1 all the way back through the negative numbers up to positive 1, right? So it starts at negative 6 and goes to 6. As y does what? What is sine? What's sine of pi? Zero. And what's sine of two pi? Zero. Is it going, if it goes in that direction, is it going through the negatives or the positives? It's going through the negatives, right? So it's also going <laughs> negative to zero. Okay? So if we look at this, that means we started at negative 6, negative 6, 0, and went to 6, 0 along the negatives. This only graphs the bottom portion of that ellipse because of that domain restriction. The 0 to pi would have given us the top part. Okay? This is going to be the most difficult part of these problems, is trying to figure out the domain equivalence. But all you have to do is plug those values in to x and y and see where they're at and what they're doing, where they're going. Okay. We know that it started here, and if you plug in like 3 pi over 2, what's cosine of 3 pi over 2? 0, right? And what's sine of 3 pi over 2? Negative 1. So that's going to give us 0, negative 4. That's down here. So that means we're going in this direction from here to here. Okay. T equals 3 halves, 3 pi over 2. Okay?
So anytime you want to find a parametric set of equations for any function, the easiest thing to do is just set x equal to t. It's stupid, but it works. If x equals t, then just plug in t for x in the y, and you've got a set of parametric equations. For example, here you've got y equals x squared minus 25. What's the parametric equations, or what's a set of parametric equations for this function? Step one, x equals t. If x equals t, what does y equal? Just let x equal t. So what's this going to be? t squared minus 25. There's your set of parametric equations. That's it. Like I said, that's kind of silly, but it does it. It, it. it lets you break it down as two equations. Okay? It's not the only set, it's just the easiest set. Okay? Now, before we dismiss, let me pull that section up. whopping nine problems. So here, this is just plugging in, making your t-chart. So that shouldn't be too hard, right? Just plug in your values for t and get your ordered pairs. Same thing there. Same thing here. Plugging in values for t for x and y. Here, we're going to eliminate the variable. If x equals 5t plus 5, y equals 25t squared. So we didn't do one like this, but if this is the case, if you've just got regular non-trigonometric, uh, non the reason we did a trig function one was because they're much more difficult. If you don't have a trig function one and you've just got t's in them, then all you have to do is just solve one of them for t and plug that substitute the t back into the other one, okay? So if you've got something like insert new slide, please. Say you've got x equals 5t plus 5 and y equals 2t minus 3. And you want to eliminate the par uh, parameter then just take one of them, say x equals 5t plus 5, subtract 5, x minus 5 equals 5t, divide by 5, t equals x minus 5 over 5. Take that and plug it into the other equation for t. So you get y equals 2 times x minus 5 over 5 minus 3. Now you don't have any more t's. You've just got y equals uh, 2 fifths times x minus 5 minus 3, you know, whatever. So you have an equation with just x and y, no t. And you've eliminated the variable or the parameter. Okay? So it's much easier to do without trig functions. Mm -hmm. So, like with the uh, finding parametric equations, you said that's not the only set. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Let's see. Let me see if they ask you for it real quick before.
So this says find two different sets of parametric equations. So, yes. So the first one they say let x equal t. So if x equals t, then 5t minus 1. Now, you can let t be something else, or you know, x be something else. I'm not going to do that one. I'll do some. I'll do something else. What was that equation? 5x minus 1. So say we've got y equals 3x plus 7. And you want to write that as a set of parametric equations. Okay? Let x be t. It's real easy. y equals 3t plus 7. There's 1. Well, let x be 2t. Okay? Okay? How do I make that work? Okay, if x is 2t, then y equals 3 times 2t plus 7. y equals 6t plus 7. Right? If x equals 3t plus 4, then y equals 3 times 3t plus 4 plus 7, or y equals 9t plus 12 plus 7, or y equals 9t plus 19. Just x equals something, plug that x in. That's it. There's infinitely many sets of parametric equations. You can let x be whatever you want it to be. Just t is the easiest one. Okay? Any questions? All right. We will come back and do a review on Tuesday, uh, and then test will be on Thursday. I will have it up before, probably Tuesday of next week. No, no quiz. It'll be a sample test.